So today's session, basically, as I said, is uh, pretty much uh, concentrated around integrating Cassandra with Hadoop. How do we integrate a Hadoop and Cassandra? So there are two ways to look at it. One is, uh, say, run your own uh, Hadoop system. Because there is, see, both of them are actually using two different uh, storage subsystems, right? So Cassandra actually follows a column family based uh, storage, whereas HDFC, HDFS forms uh, uses some sort of a chunking model where it actually chunks the data into pieces and then those pieces are stored as is inside your uh, data nodes. So they actually can't be interchanged in the sense like so if uh, the Hadoop cannot directly read Cassandra's column family and uh, Cassandra cannot write to a, a Hadoop or a data node in a sense, right? So that's the reason there's a big challenge with respect to integrating them together, right? So one option is, okay, run your own uh, offline pool or low LTP basically which means that you run your, uh, so you offline you pull the data from your OLTP system, so that's from your cluster from Cassandra and then you use the scoop, flume or other ETL process to aggregate and pull in data inside your uh, Hadoop and then you can determine analytics out of it, right? So that is the offline on concept where you're talking about taking the data from Cassandra and then use the scoop, flume or some mechanisms to actually import that into HDFS and then uh, do the analysis on the data to create a offline analysis, but it's naturally meant to be for only high latency offline analysis. Basically, you're talking about, say, even if you're pulling it on a daily basis, <coughs> so you're taking the, on a daily basis the back, uh, data from Cassandra and pushing it in. So there's a delay of approximately a day and, and again, the amount of time that you, you spend in processing the data will be the additional delay that you would have before you have the results of the analytics. Sometimes it might be late, sometimes it is it's basically useful, but there is a lot of useful cases where you talk about history analytics, which is very highly used in the industry today. So for history analytics and etc., this will still work. There's no issue as such. But when it comes to a case where you're really not, uh, history analytics is not, I want really the real-time analysis, then you have to follow some sort of an online pool model where you actually have to analyze the live data from the transactional DB. Okay, so it, you need to obtain the live data at the same time push it into HDFS need to f and then immediately feed feedback the results into the live system and then uh, excuse me and then reduce the complexity improve maintainability of MR jobs and etc. But how do you do such kind of stuff? So there are two different integration models. One is offline, the other one is online, right? So what do, how do we do? Let's look at it. Okay, so two models. Now, since we have two types of integrations which are possible, one is offline, the other one is online, let's look at the different uh, type of integration models we're talking about. One is a standalone model. The first one in the class is a standalone model. What does a standalone model basically means? You have independent clusters. One is a Hadoop cluster, the other one is basically the Cassandra cluster. So both of them are actually separate, absolutely running in their own environments and absolutely in their own different business units. Uh, they are basically exposing for B2B consumption, basically which means that Cassandra is exporting some data out which gets moved into the Hadoop ecosystem, Hadoop processes the data and pushes uh, some the results in, in some form uh, to Cassandra and then Cassandra uses those results. But that's like again uh, absolutely two different independent infrastructures which are running separately. Which surely is a big overhead because you're talking about actually maintaining two different clusters uh, separately for uh, just trying to do uh, some sort of analytics on your uh, on your basically the runtime transaction based system. Okay, that's a standalone model. Sorry. Okay, then the hybrid model. What's a hybrid model? Hybrid model basically says, uh, sorry, standalone model is hybrid model. Okay. 
So you are actually trying to deploy all your Hadoop on the Cassandra or a set of nodes inside the Cassandra cluster itself. So assume you are, as shown in the figure, so assume that you have a eight node cluster of Cassandra cluster. So some part of it, a, a half of it is actually dedicated only for Cassandra specific operations. The other half basically you have deployed Hadoop also in addition to Cassandra. So there is a master and there are set of slaves, but all of them are Cassandra nodes themselves. Okay, this is basically the advantage is it's a shared infrastructure, so administrator has to worry about only one single cluster and not really worry about the multiple clusters to be managed. It's shared workflow, dedicated groups, dedicated groups basically because your Hadoop group is different from Cassandra group anyways here internally. Uh, but uh, one advantage is uh, since uh, uh, it's, it's actually running inside the Cassandra cluster, the single point of failure sort of gets reduced to some extent because uh, uh, since the master is actually any of the Cassandra nodes, so even if uh, a particular node fails, there is another one which can actually do the job for you. Uh, but uh, what are the bigger disadvantages? So assume that actually one of them could actually eat up the processing capability of the other one in any sense because it's going to be very, very it has to be a big health machine which can manage both of them at the same time, right? So this is a hybrid model where you could actually dedicate groups uh, so which is doing only Cassandra based nodes and the other ones is basically a combination of Cassandra and Hadoop. And then the last one is all in all overlap model. Absolutely single cluster, all of them are running Hadoop, all of them are running Cassandra shared infrastructure, shared workflow, run in Cassandra and Hadoop on the same cluster, run analytics and real-time queries on all nodes. This is the third all-in-one, all-in-all overlap model. So there are three different types of motivation. One is a standalone where you have actually having absolutely two different clusters and they exchange data between them. The second one basically is uh, again uh, you are still you're taking your right running both of them in the same cluster but you're still dedicating a set of nodes for uh, each of them saying that a pure Cassandra and a Cassandra Hadoop combination is one set of it inside the cluster and the third model is basically an absolute overlap where you're say you're running both Hadoop and Cassandra everything on uh, on all the nodes in the cluster Okay, so here we'll introduce uh, something which we'll talk about. Uh, so there again, and when it comes to your uh, integration, right? It could be multiple ways. One is like, okay, you can just do only read only from Cassandra in the sense like uh, you get all your transaction data from Cassandra, feed it to HDFS, and HDFS you run the analytics and and just see those analytics reports out. You're not writing anything back to Cassandra, but it could be writing back to Cassandra where you want to write some results on which you want to control your uh, uh, online transaction processing for example. So in which case you need a write to Cassandra. So there's something called CFS which we want to introduce here. I will introduce it. Uh, so what is CFS and what is HDFS? Uh, and pick interface, how interface and etc. Okay. So give me one second. Okay. Okay, so now uh, when you're running both of them together, so they have to exchange the data in some way or the other, right? Because because there is no, both of them use, have their own uh, storage mechanisms. They don't really map to each other, right? Because the Hadoop cluster stores them in chunks of data inside data nodes and whereas Cassandra stores them as in, in a column families. So instead of that, they actually define something called a uh, an input format and an output format, which is basically a, some sort of an intermediary mechanism between the two different uh, storage models. So it's called column family input of format or CFIF or column family output format. So all the inputs or rather the data that is read from uh, uh, the Cassandra column family, it gets converted to column family input format, 
which gets fed to the Hadoop cluster, and Hadoop cluster actually shares back a CFOF, which is more, it's basically an agreement. It's some sort of an agreement between both the clusters saying that, okay, this is the day, form in which I will give you the data, and after processing, this is the form in which I will give you the data. So they, they have defined this interface, what we call it a CFIF and CFOF, for exchanging the data between the two clusters, uh, between Hadoop and uh, Cassandra. Okay, so then Cassandra file system. Okay, so what is a Cassandra file system? Now, now that we have understood how the HDFS actually works, right? So we need to have, if you have some file system, which is very similar to HDFS, right? Which is very similar to HDFS inside Cassandra, some support very similar to HDFS inside Cassandra, then you can completely get away from HDFS, which means that your OLTP data is written into the Cassandra and your analytics data is also read from your OLTP database in a way, right? So you don't really have to have two different storage systems, which was the problem to you know because there is no mechanism of actually uh, doing that today. So Cassandra actually introduced something called Cassandra file system, which is basically an HDFS compatible file system. but uh, this is actually introduced only in the commercial version, which is the uh, data stacks version of uh, uh, Cassandra. Uh, it is not available in the open source version. So it's not there in the open source uh, Cassandra distribution. This is something which is available out of the box inside uh, the data stacks distribution. And data stacks distribution actually provides Hadoop also inbuilt into the Cassandra distribution. So as a result, uh, if you have any Hadoop uh, programs that you want to run, you can take that and do some basic modifications and that should run on your uh, CFS based uh, system just like that. So that is the biggest advantage of uh, using a CFS. Basically all your Hadoop programs you can run directly on your uh, Cassandra system itself. So in a way you are actually having a analytics uh, system over a transaction processing system or, your, or over an OLTP systems. So Kavita, did you get that? So as I said, so this is basically the ones which is very highly used in the industry today. Uh, but uh, as as I said, all the people who are using it, they're using the commercial version of uh, Cassandra because it provides you a CFS out of the box, which uh, is basically a HDFS compatible file system. So there are some additional advantages because uh, I know the, with YAN, uh, Hadoop has improved quite a bit, but uh, it's still a single point of failure in a way, it's master-slave model. So bringing the entire Hadoop name node, secondary name node and data node capabilities into Cassandra, the complete single point of failure issue is gone. Because now that uh, the, all Cassandra nodes are absolutely equal, and if some particular way of handling the name node functionality is already put into the Cassandra system itself. Uh, then, since all nodes inside Cassandra are absolutely equal, the SPOF issue is completely gone, right? And absolutely easy how to do integration because, as I said, you can run your programs with a slight bit of a tweak here and there. We'll look at some examples of the tweaks, and then you can just uh, run your Hadoop programs directly on your uh, CFS-based system. So how does it work? Let's understand the CFS. So you look at a CFS, right? So basically what you want, as far as the name node is concerned, the name node basically takes a file, breaks down that into multiple pieces of blocks and some blocks in a compressed format and then this, it stores it in, inside your data nodes, right? So what did CFS do? Say so CFS basically did this. It moved all your uh, name node mappings of your block to the bigger chunks into a column family called inode which actually has the file to the block mappings and some additional metadata associated with that file which actually is resides in your name node. In addition to that each of these blocks actually are broken down into multiple sub blocks which is stored in another column family called s blocks. 
and each of the sub block actually has a UUID for uh, referencing the sub block and the data associated with that actually stored as part of that sub block. Or rather, it refers to the data set residing somewhere else. So, by introducing two column families, they completely took out the dependency on the name node, name node concept. So, what exactly whatever HDFS does, they have brought in, in inside your uh, Cassandra system by introducing these two column families, which basically gives you an imitation. Uh, sorry, it sort of imitates the uh, way HDFS actually works. And this data, which is sitting inside your sub block, uh, is basically, I mean, it's, it's anyway a chunk of data, right? The chunk of data could be coming from a column family itself or it could be coming from something, some other way. And the conversion between the column family and this data is actually defined by the interface that we talked about, the CFIF and the CFOF. Okay? So by introducing two column families, now that the entire name node, uh, important name node functionality actually has come into two column families, which are actually anyway residing on every node inside the Cassandra cluster, the entire SPOF is gone completely, right? Because since there are already set of column families which are basically the metadata or uh, system kind of column families which are sitting out there, which are available on every node, which automatically means that they are always available and they are never lost, even if one system, one particular node goes down. Okay, any questions? So CFS actually helps a lot and it's absolutely a decentralized, replicated, compressed, HDFS compatible, allows for running memory programs and DSC, which is data stacks enterprise, without any change. I mean, it's just like some small tweaks, but uh, not really a logic change or anything. The formats in which you form the, you pass the data changes, where the data types that you pass basically change, because uh, since it, this takes in bytes and etc., some of it is easily manageable. We'll, we'll look at some examples, okay? So, some basic uh, examples that we'll look at. So, how does it work? So, if you look at the map, map reduce format, uh, input data is naturally reduced, is distributed to nodes. Each map works on a split of data. Mapper outputs the intermediate data, data exchange between nodes in a shuffle process. It's exactly what we have seen, okay? And the same thing happens in the case of CFIF. So you do a column family split, okay? And then there is something called a column family record reader, which sort of helps you in doing all your uh, shuffling and etc., which is actually happens in the map reduce process. And then finally, after the reduce, whatever comes out, it comes out as a column family output format. So there are intermediary uh, mechanisms introduced, something like column family split, column family record readers, and etc which help you in managing or manipulating this input and output formats on the input data. Okay? So CFS provides these things out of the box. Okay, so how does it change from the existing HDFS tracker? So client submits a job, job goes to the job tracker. Okay? and then uh, it receives uh, some information from the configuration options. The configuration options say that, okay, uh, this is basically a Hadoop based, uh, Hadoop sitting inside Cassandra file system, so it basically has some set of Hadoop configurations and Cassandra configuration options. We look at some of those options, what are the various options available, but uh, so you need to configure that, it receives the information from the configuration options then it uses something called column family record reader which actually reads from a column family directly the input data for the job say for example in this case the price or something it picks up all the data information associated with that does all the column family split if required and then uh, uses that data for doing the processing so basically your data is coming from a column family instead of the chunk model in which you uh, in, H, in which HDFS manages. So it does this and then it provides the data in, uh, in a specific format which can be on which you can run your uh, MapReduce jobs. We'll see that, okay? So what are the various configuration stuff that happens? So basically there's something called 
Cassandra specific configuration, there's something called Hadoop configuration. So as far as all your job input classes and etc., they have to be in line with the input as uh, your interface input classes. So now the job actually gets column family input format. It creates the column family output format. Then it takes all your output key class as a byte buffer because a byte is the default uh, mechanism inside Cassandra. So it uses byte buffer instead of uh, the other things which it actually uses. And then in the output it uses list. So these are pretty much the, you're trying to map uh, something which is very, which is basically supported on both sides. Right, so byte buffer is something which you can take directly inside Cassandra because Cassandra takes data directly as bytes as well as as lists. So you're trying to basically map the data types which are common across both of them. And then there is a Cassandra specific com configuration which you call it as uh, say put your set input column families, input partitioners, etc. which is specific to Cassandra. All of that stuff you actually have to configure. So you have input data which is basically distributed into the nodes. So each map track, map task actually works on a split of data. So it goes to a particular node, takes the split of the data, run the map job on it or rather multiple levels of map on it. Uh, it could not be just one level. Here we are showing only one level but it could be multiple levels of maps. And once the maps are all done, the map, mapper outputs the intermediary data. Once its intermediary data is out, then you do a shuffle. Shuffle in the sense like you actually make sure that all the related keys are actually accumulated together. Once on the similar keys are actually accumulated together, then you run the reduce, which will uh, surely reduce the overall data. Basically, it's sort of in crunching the existing data. It reduces the overall data, and then that gets written to a output, which is here reducer output. So coming to your Hadoop mappers, uh, so the basic uh, input key is byte buffer. Okay, input value is basically a sorted map of byte buffer and something called an I column. Okay, and then uh, Cassandra is byte buffer util to read and write byte buffers. Map output will be writable as a standard as in standard MR and this output will be in the CFOF format, okay? Sorry, the reduce output is the CFOF. Map can be anything. So these are the basic changes. So assume that you have a Hadoop mapper code. Uh, the Basically the changes will be like this. So you're sending a byte buffer now and text is in it writable wherever you need to. So the data types actually are the ones which are changing. Basically making it something which is compatible uh, for both of them. So your input to the map actually changes and uh, then when you retrieve the data also you get the configuration in line with the specific column name and etc. So these are the only the blue ones which are actually shown on the screen are the ones which will change in your existing mapper code otherwise you can just run the map, map code as it is. Because the way in, in which you are actually uh, is there some example in LMS where I can understand Cassandra how to use case? Uh, there is no example as such. Yeah, the only option that I have is I have to create one. And uh, as I said, the the CFS is available only inside a data stacks enterprise distribution of Cassandra. So the only option that I have is I have to get a data stack enterprise installed. I actually have it installed, but uh, I need to get it working because the mechanism in which the data stacks enterprise runs is a little different because it doesn't run in general open source model. It uses something called DSC, DSC everywhere. So um, just, it's just a matter of spending some time understanding through the documentation and setting it up. But uh, I just didn't find time to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll try and see if I can get something and I'll show it to you next week. If I install Cassandra on my Hadoop cluster, will that help? No, right? Because the biggest problem right now, we talk, we're talking about it, right? So because HDFS and Cassandra are actually stored the data in different formats. So even if you install, both of them have their own storage. So you should have a mechanism to map the storage between them. And that mapping is something which 
is a big thing. It's a very, very huge thing to be done actually at the as any developer. So you're really going to build you're building a new system in a sense, like because the column families that you are storing and the chunks which you store in HDFS, they have to be mapped in some way. And if you can write that mapping code between them, but then it's absolutely fine. And CFS indirectly does that in a way, right? So CFS sort of does that for you. Okay? Make sense, Dija? It, it won't just like that work, but as I said, but you could, uh, as I said, uh, whatever I'm trying to do, that is possible. Where I said you can install Spark on your Cassandra cluster, okay? Wherever you have running Cassandra, so you can run, you can install Spark, and uh, there is something called an open source connector, which is available on the GitHub, called Spark Cassandra connector. So the mechanism it actually uses is, it actually has, uh, so all your column families are actually, actually exposed as RDDs, which is the, the data structures that are used inside Spark. So your tables are available as RDDs out of the box, which helps you to query, manipulate, do everything, whatever you need to do in a general Hadoop manner. You want to run MapReduce on them and etc. You can do it very easily. So if you're looking at the open source kind of a stuff, that is a mechanism that you can use, where you can take in Cassandra, cluster, install uh, Spark on that one, and then uh, that will be uh, exported as RDDs, and then you can run your queries on RDDs. Uh, basically, you can write your, run your Spark scripts and Spark code on that one, Spark functions, API on that one. Uh, so this is actually something which is very, already used by a company in US. I'm not sure whether it's a good idea to say that, but you can find it out. Uh, a very huge company who does a lot of video streaming and etc. inside in in California, they actually use this mechanism of running Spark on Cassandra. Okay. Okay. On the reducer side, input is uh, whatever you get from your map, and then output key is a byte buffer, which is nothing but a row key in Cassandra because anyway a row key is a hash. So byte buffer will actually sort of map a row key in sense in Cassandra, and output value is a list list of or basically the columns you want to change. So similarly, it will take uh, text as input, the reducers, which is actually the output of your map, and then it will write uh, the keys and the results directly to your. Uh, it could write it to the column family directly, or it could write it to some intermediary mechanism from where it could be exported and written into column families. So the reducer uses uh, CFOF to output its results. CFOF writes the results out to the file system or it could be written directly inside, uh, directly to Cassandra via thrift. So similarly when it comes to pig interfacing, uh, if you're looking at a standard column family, so this is exactly what you would actually do it in pig. So if you want to return all the rows from your CFS, you could just say load and give the Cassandra URL. Cassandra colon 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 slash slash key space col slash column family using Cassandra storage as the byte array and the columns as a tuple name comma value and then that will give you all the rows that you want to really read inside pig. Similarly for super column family you can use the appropriate one inside pig. So your load command inside pig can actually do it like this with CFS. Similarly the store command you can give you the uh, same URL Cassandra key space column family URL and using Cassandra storage you can store the data back to uh, Cassandra column family. Okay. Similarly, Hive, uh, naturally there are data type changes, so basically SQL3 is text, which Hive is string and etc. so all these mappings have to be done properly. It's just a reference for you guys as to how does it actually get mapped, begin, begin, it's pretty much similar, SQL3 and sort of works out on the similar lines, but uh, Hive does not have any UUIDs or the hashes, so they basically become binary types as far as Hive is concerned. Okay, so then uh, you need to set a set of properties which has uh, 
the serialization, deserialization properties, the table properties, etc. Uh, uh, between Hive and uh, Cassandra. So all the information is provided here. Uh, so you need to set all these properties in detail. And then once it is done, uh, then it's the survey properties for page size, partitioner, port, input split size, SQL3 type, host, key space name, key space replication factor, factor, key space strategy, key space strategy options, which is more of a network topology strategy. So all these things you need to set. Once this is set, then you can use those information while running your Hive queries. So you can just say something like this, create external table, if you want to create your Hive table inside uh, your CFS. Uh, the only difference is you are creating by Hive, but you are saying stored by the appropriate storage handler inside Cassandra. With the specific table properties, key space name, replication factor, strategy if there is anything, and then simple strategy, etc. Then and certain properties, the serialization, deserialization properties, host, port number, name of the key space, username and password in case if they are have access related restrictions. So this is the uh, simple Hive DDL example where you're creating a Hive table, but inside CFS. Similarly, you, for doing a DML, inserting uh, data, overwrite table. Uh, a particular table, select start, so and so, so and so, group and join, etc. So you can do exactly the same queries in line with uh, what you would have done in your uh, general IVDML. Okay.